This training is going to talk through some of the performance tuning and performance capabilities of the Broadcom Ethernet NIC. Alright, to uh, just kind of level set here with the metrics typically used with network performance, we typically measure in both throughput and latency. Um, so throughput here is the amount of data that's sent and received uh, per second. This can be measured in a couple ways, usually either millions of packets per second um, or in gigabits per second. To calculate the expected performance against the line rate, uh, one thing to keep in mind is that there is always protocol header um, overhead. So if you're operating on a 100 gigabit link, you're not going to see 100 gigabit of TCP data traffic. You're, to achieve line rate, you have to take into account um, the overhead of, of the TCP header itself. So here we have an example um, of using iperf with TCP with the standard MTU of 1500 bytes, um, where the overhead works out to be about 5%. So this is just something to keep in mind uh, that this does come into play when you're talking about throughput, uh, especially in terms of you know, gigabits per second. And then this will vary uh, the overhead depending on which uh, protocol you're, you're interested in. The other a commonly used metric here is latency, so this is the time required to send or receive a packet. This can be used in a number of different ways, either a one-way trip or a round trip, and this will vary considerably depending on the topology um, and where and how that the packet needs to travel. Alright, so a few factors that can impact NIC performance. These are all system level uh, components. We'll kind of walk through these. The first being um, the CPU of the systems under test. So this can uh, be the frequency of the CPUs used as well as the architecture. Uh, AMD versus Intel can have a big impact in both the results you see and how you need to configure the tests you're running because of the differences in this architecture. So this is something especially important to keep in mind. The power mode of the system is also pretty important. It's particularly if you're trying to achieve um, some of the higher throughput metrics. So as far as benchmarking goes, we will always recommend to use performance mode, disable these low power states, because uh, that will only hurt you when you're trying to prove out the hardware. Multi-threaded systems or multi-threaded CPUs. Uh, this is another thing to, to keep in mind. We typically recommend using physical cores before using the hyper-threaded cores, just to avoid maxing out a single physical core and having that ultimately be the bottleneck. And then NUMA, of course, is very important, and again, especially with these higher bandwidth test cases, to ensure that the memory being used to send and receive the packets is local to the, the NIC itself to avoid um, some of the cross-NUMA latency you'll incur um, otherwise. And that can give a pretty big hit to both latency and throughput if, if it's not configured correctly. A couple of the other kind of obvious ones, the, the amount of memory in use um, can play a big role, and the PCIe bandwidth is also very important to can get bottlenecked by the PCIe bandwidth depending on if you're using a Gen 3 or Gen 4 server or by 8 by 16 link. So that's something to keep in mind. You will not be able to achieve line rate if line rate is more data than the PCIe bus can push. And then there are a variety of OS and kernel level tunings that we'll talk about a little bit and you know we have outlined a little more deeply in the performance tuning guide. Just to give a kind of high level look of how a packet moves through the network or how Linux receives a network packet rather. This goes through a number of different interrupts, uh, both on the hardware side and on the kernel side. So when the uh, NIC itself receives a packet, it will generate a hardware interrupt that will be caught by the NIC driver. This will then trigger a software interrupt to the kernel to start processing that packet through the kernel's TCP IP protocol stack. This then goes through the, uh, the kernel stack, processed by the kernel, fed through the socket, and then ultimately with the, ends with the user application. And then you can, of course, think of this process in reverse if the packet's being transmitted rather than received. One tool that can be useful to look at this whole process is top. Um, I have a screenshot here of this, but it, it can be helpful to determine where the processing time is, is slow. So if, for example, you're spending a lot of time in the kernel stack, you know, then you may be able to surmise the issues not actually on the, the NIC or the hardware itself, but there's some other tunings or there's something going wrong at the OS level. All right, so once we take that concept of receiving a single packet and we extend it to receiving you know, millions of packets per second, as mentioned earlier, um, we have to look at how we actually store those and then process that up to the, the upper layers. So this is done by uh, transmit and receive rings. So the TX and RX rings are a buffer descriptor, and this is also uh, that holds the packets and describes where they are and helps feed them into the kernel. This is also one of the key performance tuning um, knobs. So the NIC hardware uses these rings for sending and receiving packets, and there are a few different things you can do here to uh, affect how the rings are set up, initialized, and how they're processed uh, by the system. 
One such option is changing the ring size. This can be achieved via ETH tool. You will see if you play with this parameter that a larger ring size can give you improved resiliency against packet loss. You've got larger buffers, uh, but this of course increases the um, cache and memory footprint on the system. So this is an area where the having more memory in the system can, can play a role. But even with larger buffer sizes, that's still nowhere near enough to hold the amount of packets needed to sustain line rate without being sure we are intelligently distributing the packets across multiple CPU cores. So that is where um, RSS comes in. This is receive side scaling. So this is a, a pretty standard way um, to distribute the load on the receive side. And so the way this works is it, the NIC hardware will uh, hash the different um, incoming streams or network uh, flows into separate RX rings um, with the goal of uh, distributing the load evenly. So depending on how many rings you have, say you have eight rings or 16 rings, the goal of RSS is to spread the load, the receive load across those uh, eight or 16 rings or whatever number you choose uh, to keep as many CPUs running as possible uh, rather than trying to process everything through a single CPU or just a, a few CPUs. So one of the important things you can change here is the number of rings. Uh, this can also be done by ETH tool. Uh, with the ultimate goal here is the more rings you have, the more CPUs you can utilize. And you can see that in action uh, through MPSTAT. Also, ETH tool has a statistics counter you can look at and you can see while packets are being received that they are balanced across the rings and uh, also importantly balanced across the CPUs. So this is a pretty important place to start. If you're seeing very low bandwidth, uh, you can check pretty quickly, or, or is RSS actually happening? Are we actually distributing the load across multiple CPUs or is something going wrong there? What we will see on the next slide is how we actually assign different CPU cores um, to these different rings and, and how we do it to ensure that we get unique CPUs to each ring. Um, and this is done via the IRQ Affinity. This is the binding of each individual ring to its own um, or potentially multiple CPU cores. As you'll see when testing this, distributing the rings across different CPU cores in parallel results in much improved performance and is all but necessary um, once you get to the higher throughput levels. At least in terms of benchmarking, we typically advise to disable the Linux IRQ balance service. So this is a Linux daemon that attempts to balance uh, interrupts evenly across the CPU cores. This is not always helpful though, especially if you have multiple NUMO domains. The RQ balance service may not actually get these interrupts on the CPUs you, you want to be running on and that can incur some costs. So at least as far as benchmarking goes, always disable the service and manually assign the IRQs ourselves. So in this third bullet, you can see an example of how to do this. Uh, you can basically set an individual CPU to an individual ring via that IRQ number. So as you can see, a couple commands here uh, to dump from slash proc interrupts. You can see which IRQs are tied to which rings. You can find the CPUs that are local to the NIC, when local meaning in the NUMA domain. And then you can assign uh, that CPU or some span of CPUs in the NUMA domain to that um, IRQ you found in the first step. And then finally, while receiving traffic, you can watch this just to be sure that the load is indeed being balanced across multiple CPU cores. So this is a pretty fundamental step with ensuring you're getting good performance um, distribution uh, and you can cause a lot of problems if not. So this is typically the, the first place to look when bringing up a new system. A couple other features that are important um, or can be important. A GRO stands for generic receive offloading. So what GRO does is it coalesces, coalesces um, several receive packets from a stream into one large packet. So say if you have some um, series of packets that are broken down into the MTU size, but before being sent were uh, some large data chunk, GRO helps uh, reduce the processing overhead by combining those in, back into a single packet and passing it up the uh, kernel stack. So in some cases, this can result in much better performance and much lower CPU utilization. It will really depend on the workload, uh, but in the cases it helps, it uh, helps quite a bit. The Broadcom NICs support GRO and hardware and are able to aggregate up to 64 KB. Uh, there are cases in certain workloads where the packets can't be aggregated, could never be aggregated, and so in that case, GRO can actually bring a bit of a performance penalty. So this is something to keep in mind. Again, really depends on the workload you're running, but in the ones it helps, it really does help. And the ones it, it doesn't, you just have to keep in mind whether the impact is worth disabling it overall. In addition to the hardware GRO, there's also a GRO support in software. This is handled up at the kernel. It can typically increase the CPU load. So just another thing to keep in mind. Then finally for 
debugging performance issues. There's a whole range of uh, actions you typically want to take. A good place to start is with the BIOS and OS tunings. Have these been tuned per the performance tuning guide? In our performance tuning guide, we outline a couple scenarios and best use cases that we found. So that's a great place to start to be sure you're actually setting up the system for optimal performance. Next one is to make sure you're considering the protocol overhead. Uh, for example, if it's a 100 gigabit link and you are getting 94 gigabits per second, um, that's the max practical bandwidth. You're not going to do better than that. Um, so just keeping in mind what actual expected performance is versus the line rate is important here. Another thing to look at is what's the throughput number in a single CPU use case. So this can help identify the performance bottleneck. Um, you're trying to figure out where exactly the slowdown is before you start adding the complexity of multiple CPU cores and processing multiple flows in parallel. So this is, this is a good um, starting point. And then once you have gone through that exercise, you can start to ask yourself why was the throughput not improved in the multiple CPU core case. So again, checking RSS and that the packets and streams are evenly loaded is the next logical step and looking at the RQ affinity and being sure that um, the RQs are actually being bound to the CPUs you want. And of course, NUMA settings are extremely important to be sure that the CPUs being used are in the same NUMA node as the NIC. You can get some pretty nasty penalties if, if you don't do so. And finally, I just want to point to our uh, performance user's guide, um, as well as uh, some of our performance reports. These are pretty easy to follow and uh, kind of get yourself going to uh, you know, do some of the testing yourself. All right, thanks.